Phocurus carolinus is the name. As kids and adults, I know it better as a firefly. These insects were something that growing up I was fascinated by. I was always wondering, why does this firefly come out for a couple of months of the year, shine its light, and then it disappears? Or when I capture it in a little container after running through the neighbor's bushes and crushing them, uh, it, the light goes out. So I was really fascinated by fireflies. This one in particular is a species out of North Carolina that um, has a blinking rhythm to it. And that was something that, that we didn't learn the SEAL teams. <laughs> uh, this was something that fascinated me from a lot of levels. And we'll kind of explore what that means. In fact, these fireflies in particular, for two weeks a year, um, begin lighting up the sky right around dusk. And they actually, the certain, the certain males of the group are the ones that emit the lights trying to track a female to mate with. In fact, they do little upward J motions, kind of particularly here. Um, and the females respond with a single blinking steady light. After several minutes, when you go watch these, and you can only really watch them for real in the foothills of the Appalachians, they all start synchronizing at once, which is really something to see. So you have a light, you have a female, then you have copycats, and pretty soon there's a, there's a visual symphony occurring in the forest, in the foothills, in the, in the Smokies, and it's something that, or in the Appalachians, and it's something that really got me thinking into nature and into what is it about these influencers, these insects, that causes the light to be carried and shared. I mean, there can't be that much coordination, but something occurs in the insect world and in nature where a single light kicks off a chain of events. We see that today more than ever. We also see it with the English starling bird, a bird that was largely not known in the United States until Shakespeare Aficionados actually released them in Central Park in 1870, and now there's over 250 million in the United States. But these birds, there's something special about them. These birds fly in these formations that are, they look choreographed. I mean, the formations, we'll get to see that in a second, but the formations turn and swoop and bend, and they, they actually uh, take signals from fellow birds. Originally, scientists thought that there was a single leader, and everybody was keying off the leader, but in fact, Every seventh bird uh, sends off the, the signal and all the others follow it. So you only have to look to your left to your right if you're one of the birds. It's uh, something to think about, which is these large groups of birds and of fireflies don't necessarily report to a single source, but they actually follow that of their peers or those next to them. And they tend to operate in flocks, like you see here. Huge flocks of synchronized starlings create beautiful sights of moving dark clouds. The phenomenon was spotted in the skies of southern Israel on Saturday. Israeli ornithologists and amateur bird watchers flocked to an open field near the southern city of Netivot to get a glance of the rare phenomenon called murmuration. Professor Yossi Leshem from Tel Aviv University says the synchronized movement is to help the birds find food and to create a defense mechanism against birds of prey. These will usually try to hunt individual birds and rarely attack big flocks. Murmuration. Fascinating word, fascinating illustration. But my question was, can that also apply to people? Do we have people in our community, in our society, that murmurate, that send a signal which gets picked up by others until there's an entire flock turning and jiving and reacting to that signal? This is Asma Mahfouz. Asma Mahfouz in 2011 was part of a movement in the Middle East and in Egypt calling for President then Mubarak to step down due to a human rights, his human rights violations. And the way Asma approached this was very different from previous people that have been social activists. See, being female in that part of the country, in that part of the world, was something that in many cases, uh, did not occur. She went on YouTube twice. The first time she went on YouTube 
was on January 18th, and she said, I have just witnessed four Tunisian men set themselves on fire protesting the government. I am going down to Tahir Square tomorrow, and I'm a female, and I'm telling my message to the world. Will you join me? And she went down, and nobody showed up, except legions of riot police officers who she had a conversation with. And she said, the men that lit themselves on fire aren't crazy. The men that lit themselves on fire were sending a message to the rest of the world. And their message was, we can no longer accept this way of life. She returned home, and on January 24th, she posted a YouTube video, which was also reposted on Facebook, that said, I am going down to Tahir Square tomorrow, and I call on every other citizen of Egypt to join me and steer their ground. I am a female, obviously, this is my name. And she publicly identified herself on open social media under the threat of, lo of losing her life and being arrested by authorities. A single murmuration from Asma Mahfouz resulted in 110,000 people showing up the next day in Tahir Square. Why? What was it? Asma didn't have a a uh, celebrity status. She didn't have a reputation. She had a message. She had a platform. And she believed in what she was doing. And she certainly wasn't scared of failure, but she put her message out there. She let her light be known to people because that's what she believed in. So this is Matt. Matt runs a very small blog about American League Baseball teams. Matt's not, Matt's like the rest of us. He, he's an amateur blogger. In fact, on one of his primary social networks, he posted a video displayed here. Has anybody seen this video? It's really cool. Okay. There is a group of, of um, a thousand bands in Italy that got together and they played the Foo Fighters song, Learning to Fly and they all did it synchronized. It was one song they gathered in the middle of the field, and they played it once. And Matt said, I think this is a really cool video. I'm just going to push this out on my social network. A social network represented here by a dot. That's Matt. And Matt has 567 followers. Probably not going to compete with Kim Kardashian at least on initial inspection. So Matt posted this one YouTube video, which went out to his network, and later reached 2.9 million people. So this is a software that I designed that really allowed me to understand this notion of murmuration. Could we quantifiably determine where a signal started and the rate by which a signal spread? And what do we know about that? We know that the big green circle in the lower left is an Argentinian tennis player. What does he have with Matt in common with Matt? Nothing other than liking this one video. So what can we learn about the signals that we put online? What can we learn about the messages that we put online? And what does our second and third order ecosystem tell us? It tells us that if you have a message, and if you share your message, like Matt did with this, you actually may result in reaching an ecosystem represented here, reaching over 40 million people. A single post to 40 million people. Buildings, like people, emit signals. We just heard from the Salesforce team and we did not collaborate before this uh, presentation. But we see that the, a building represents a certain spirit of the community that it's in. And this is not anything really new to development. The Tower of Alexandria in Egypt in 300 BC was the tallest structure ever built at that time. It was designed by the Egyptian government as a symbol of the new burgeoning business in the port of Alexandria, but it was also designed to represent the strength of the nation. 
Now, it didn't have a, a lot. The, the, the top was lit by massive uh, burning oil furnaces so that sailors coming into the port would know where the port was. But that example we see today here in Boston as well with the Prudential Center. We see this being an iconic symbol of not just the pride of living in Boston, but also more reflecting on what the people in the community feel about Boston. And there's a growing, what the data is showing us is that there's a growing symbiosis between the online world and what people are posting like Matt and Ozma and how the community and businesses around it are responding. That ecosystem is growing closer and that ecosystem is reflecting the fireflies that we see. In some cases, those buildings also reflect the sentiment of a city that may not be good. This is a picture uh, following the Boston Marathon tragedy here. And I remember talking with Coop and he said, listen, Mayor Menino called me in my office and said, Brian, thank you for lighting up the Prudential Center because it sends a message to all of Boston that we're going to get through this. And I said, you know, it also sends a message that the corporate entities like Boston Properties, they're part of the community too. They're feeling the pain and they're feeling what people in the community are feeling as well. And they have an ability to send their message and put their light. We see that here. We also see it with the 9-11 tribute that occurs. In each one of these cases, we are seeing a building reflect sentiment of its populace. I was really moved by this slide because we see that with the Salesforce Tower as well. We see when these towers and when these buildings have lights or emit a signal, the entire social media ecosystem lights up. We see people walking by now have an affiliation or an opinion with a space and place. Whereas before, it was just a building. Now, it might be more iconic in a city. As people are moving more into cities, we see cities moving more into people. And we start to see that the most effective corporations and development entities are the ones that grow alongside the community growth and are in the conversations and also reflect messages of the people that walk by the buildings, not just that live in the buildings. So Boston Properties and Coop's number one law of real estate, space and place drive behavior. We see that in a Boston Properties entity in Virginia. This is a, a picture of Reston Town Center. It is a space and a place. And you know what? Some of the behavior that these spaces drive isn't always good. But that's because when you have an entity that wants to connect with the people, it's organic. Not everybody agrees. So on May 23rd, a post was put on a TripAdvisor. Very complicated system. I'm not going there anymore. Now, many people believe this was an isolated incident. However, as we saw with Matt, that wasn't the case. It continued to develop. Tell Boston Property, scrap the app. <laughs> we started seeing a murmuration effect occurring as a result of the corporate's decision on that property uh, to handle the, the parking. We saw it continue to develop with a physical <laughs> manifestation. So again, started off as a virtual conversation with a single post, and we're starting to see this grow and grow. Went over to Facebook. <laughs> and now, we really, I mean, since I did the research on this and the, the latest, there's at least seven different organized entities online that are dedicated to address the parking issue at Reston Town Center. It culminated with a march in the streets. <laughs> I mean, who would have thought that parking was a, uh, such a contentious issue? But it makes sense. The space in place is driving behavior. And we're seeing the behavior here, which is not always good. 
the, the lesson from this instance is, or from this example is, when you see something occurring around one of your properties, you can't believe that it's going to end there. You must address it. We're no longer in an environment where we can just say, oh, well, it's just one person. What if it's Asma Mafuz? So these are things that we see unwinding and that uh, we see that there's a, a certain ability to stop them before they get too far. Speaking of space and place, I wanted to run an experiment and see what people around the world are, do in these spaces and places. So I try to take a sample of the top three piazzas in the world, which are the most heavily trafficked uh, population density areas for tourists and for um, citizens and not citizens alike. So the first one is the Piazza Navona, which is um, in Rome, Italy. Uh, the Trevi Fountain is pictured in the lower left-hand side. The right-hand side is a picture of the, the Piazza Duomo or the Duomo in Florence. That's Michelangelo's piazza. And then the bottom is San Marco, which is in Venice. Each one of these piazzas sees millions of people a year. And when you go sit in each one of these piazzas, whether you're in San Marco or you're in Navona, you start to see and feel really the pulse of the community. You see a, 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 a person maybe engaged in a heated conversation. You see somebody having fun with a child. You see people eating ice cream. The people in these piazzas are actually, in many cases, the decorations. They're the jewels that decorate the piazza surrounded by these beautiful buildings. But I wanted to know what those people were thinking. Well, we can't do that yet, thankfully. But what we can do is we can listen. We can listen to what these people are doing and what they're communicating to the world and what lights and signals they're sending on their social media platforms. So for those people that post publicly, we were able to identify over 65,000 unique comments and conversations in each piazza. And we were able to find out precisely where that concentration of conversations was occurring and to the extent that the words were being used in it. This is just a snapshot of the, some of the words discussed. You can scratch off the time zone. That's just an anomaly because some of these sites use that word. I wanted to know more, though. I wanted to know what percentage of the conversation was going on that was related to either a food and activity or space and place. So what we did was we encoded those 65,000 messages and we put them in two buckets. Is this about food and activity or is this about a space and place? We found that 6,451 of them involved a food and activity. I'm going to eat ice cream. Wow, look at that. I'm photographing the sunset. Did you happen to chase that bird? I mean, these are conversations about food or activity. 89% of the data shows that the conversation was actually about a space or a place. How beautiful is that fountain? Check out Michelangelo's uh, cathedral. Wow, look at the sculptures. So the conversations were really occurring on two fronts. One about an activity, i.e. eating or participating. The other one was around the space or place. So I thought that was kind of cool, but I wanted more. I wanted to know What's go what goes on in the Prudential Center? What goes on in a one kilometer radius around this building area? Now, we're not Italy. There's a lot of Italians here, Italian heritage here. But we're still people. And like the fireflies and like the birds, we send messages out. And we now have the ability to understand what those are. So we were able to get. Six, we actually got 200,000 messages in this vicinity, and we sorted them out into 60,000 messages and randomly selected them to be somewhat consistent, and we pulled this information. Same question, same filter process. How much of this is about a food and activity, and how much is it about a space and a place? I was expecting most of the answers and most of the data to look the same. What we found was that Bostonians really like to eat. <laughs> no. <laughs> what we found is that 
People really like to talk about food and what they're doing here in this piazza. We see 64% of the conversation was about the sunset, the skyline, probably the Pru when it's lit up, or the Salesforce Tower, etc. But most of, there's a three times the proportion amount of activity is going on in this area about food or some sort of exercising I like to run on the, on the, um, uh, on the Charles, etc. What does that tell us if we're, if we're developers? It tells us that you can really get a pulse for the community when you're able to get real-time samples like this and then build a community in development that addresses that. Now, we may not have 12th century buildings here to talk about, but we have iconic buildings and we have iconic restaurants. And anybody that's been in the area will tell you that there's a food revolution going on in this area, and a lot of that has started and was started from the murmuration created at the Prudential Center with getting rid of chain restaurants and food courts and putting in more restaurants of substance that three times the people are saying they want and are telling you they talk about. So what are our rules for real estate? Number one, space and place, they emit a signal about the populace and to the populace. They establish a two-way communication. A light goes on in a tower, people on the ground see it and probably talk about it. Something goes on in the ground, like the Red Sox win, it gets shown in the Prudential Building. There's an ability now to establish a two-way conduit with inanimate objects like a building and the people that live in around uh, that area. Number two, developers and owners must take accountability. This is no longer a time where we can ignore what everybody says because we own the building. You might get a little bit ahead with that mentality, but you'll never sustain an ecosystem like a, 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 what the fireflies create with their harmony. You'll never, you'll never achieve a two-way communication ecosystem where there is buy-in both from people that live in the space and people that walk by it. Third, the strength and purity of the signal actually correlate to its value. If people are talking about food and activity, and that is something that is consistently conducted, then the value is in that. If people are talking about a space and a place and an architecture, then that also correlates to where developers should seek their value. I'm not saying that being able to capture this data necessarily is gonna give you a crystal ball, but I'm gonna say it's a whole heck of a lot better than the current standards now in many development ecosystems where it's, we're just gonna build it because it's good for the city. We've gone one step further and partnered with Italy to help them bring a little bit of Italy here into Boston. Why? Because we know that Italy isn't just a space and a place where you can eat, shop, and learn, but it also is a place where a lot of the discussions we saw were occurring around a food or an activity. Anybody that's ever been there will tell you that you don't, go, you don't need to be a Michelin two-star chef to appreciate Italy. You can go in and taste any sort of Italian delicacy, cheese, you can learn about wine, you can even take classes on how to make pasta, my grandmother style. <laughs> um, and, and really, you walk into Italy to taste a little bit of Italy. You don't walk into Italy just to eat lunch. And what we're starting to see with the data is that as this area of Boston continues to embrace Italy and grow with it, we believe that time is coming for an Italian event that occurs in these piazzas to now occur here, and it's called Apertivo. It is a time after work where people in the piazza gather and to talk about the work day, to share a light drink or cocktail, and to really be a citizen of the community they live in and unplug from work. We're seeing a need for that. We're addressing that need, working with Boston Properties in Italy, and that is gonna uh, come here to Boston. You're going to see Apertivo become a mainstream activity in this area. In fact, we believe that it will continue to grow outside of just the back bay and become a mainstay. What am I saying? I'm saying that buildings 
of today really have a responsibility and an opportunity to reflect what is going on at the street level and not at the board level. They have the ability to listen to what people think of that building and what they want to do with that building and to be a heck of a lot more accurate than thinking they understand the neighborhood because they might have resided in it for 25 years. The, the turnover in this city, since I moved out of here several years ago, but I still have the accent, I'm told, down in Texas. I don't know how they can tell. Uh, <laughs> has changed considerably. And what we're starting to see is that success and development in the future tomorrow is going to be to those who understand that everybody has a light, and that light can be seen both by people and emitted and reflected by buildings. Thank you.